Okay, so today is busier than I expected. We have had Siri leak in the Apple event. I know we're going to have the official announcement pretty soon, so I'll probably use that right here and show you what the thing looks like, the tagline, all that stuff. Haven't got that yet because uh, it's not been officially announced. So, exciting times. We've got an event coming on April 20th, unless Siri's trolling us. That is doubtful, however. But we had actually got some regular news that we were going to do today, so there is more stuff to talk about. Let's do it. And coming up later in this video, we've got exclusive 14-inch MacBook Pro renders coming from Apple Tomorrow. I used some of them in the video earlier as well. But he needs a shout-out, and here it is. Apple Tomorrow, you rock. But other stuff happening in the world that kind of affects Apple. Starting off with NVIDIA is making their own CPUs. NVIDIA has been in the process of buying ARM holdings, or at least trying to for a little while now. And at their spring GPU technology conference, they've announced that they are designing their own ARM-based CPU SOCs. These go under the name of Grace and are especially designed for large-scale neural network workloads. The SOC is expected to use the ARM v8.2 instruction set, or possibly even the brand new v9 architecture, and will launch in 2023, all being well. It appears that the SoC will use a unified memory system just like the Apple M1 and Nvidia's NVLink 4, giving 900 gigabytes a second between CPU and GPUs on the SoC and 600 gigabytes per second between other CPUs, which suggests they'll be able to use multiple SoCs in the same system, which is what I'd previously suggested for the Apple Silicon Mac Pro to reduce the number of SoCs required to be designed. So while this isn't something you're likely to see at your desk very soon, it will certainly worry Intel, who have a huge market share in server and enterprise systems right now. Following on from this, Apple has had a crazy first quarter of 2021. Their market share of traditional computers has now grown from 5.8 to 8% with worldwide Mac shipments growing from 3.75 to 5.57 million Macs in the same quarter, up 48%. 8% of the PC market isn't that bad either, especially when you include tablets as being a computer, which it certainly fulfills the criteria of, and people are buying tablets instead of computers quite a lot now. Apple's market share then jumps all the way up to 17.7%, which makes Apple the number two computer manufacturer in the world. And it's important to remember that in a year, everything in the category that Apple sells will be powered by ARM-based chips. With NVIDIA, Microsoft, and more now looking to build their own ARM SoCs, I'm pretty confident by 2025, x86 will be in the minority of computers, not the majority. Of course, everyone comes straight back to me with the fact that software support isn't there yet, but as soon as the public sees the difference and starts demanding better performance and battery life, that will pretty quickly follow if Microsoft doesn't want a mass exodus from Windows. And while what Apple and Tim Cook have done seems nothing short of magic, what's really happened is that they've bravely shown what is possible, like an iPhone without a headphone jack, or a charger in the box, or a laptop without an optical drive as they did with the MacBook Air. And as usual, the industry will follow suit and tell Apple that they didn't innovate. New A12 chips get a security update. Apple has made the unusual move of improving the secure enclave in their A12 and S5 based SOCs produced since fall of last year, bringing them up to the second generation of the secure enclave. That means that any HomePod mini, Apple Watch SE or iPad 8th generation will have the more secure version. Apple's support document for this says, Devices first released in fall 2020 or later are equipped with a second generation secure storage component. The second generation secure storage component adds counter lockboxes. Each counter lockbox stores a 128-bit salt, a 128-bit passcode verifier, an 8-bit counter, and an 8-bit maximum attempt value. Access to the counter lockboxes is through an encrypted and authenticated protocol. Now, I got Siri to read that because it sounded complicated to me, but it does suggest one of two things. There was either some kind of a security issue with the older version that Apple was not comfortable with leaving as it was, potentially leaving them vulnerable to a future attack, which is mildly worrying, or that there is something that Apple wants to do in future that these devices will need to have the newer version to enable. Either way, it's an interesting point that Apple is making the investment to upgrade its older SoCs, which I don't think has happened in the past. Then we have some weird Apple TV, HomePod, iPad hybrid rumours. There are two kind of distinct ideas for what the Apple TV and HomePod could be involving in evolving into in the future, and one sounds a lot more likely than the other. So let's start up with the most mental one. Apple TV and HomePod could be combining into some sort of weird robot arm based iPad on a stick that tracks you around the room. Other than sounding a bit like a dystopian nightmare, I love that every news outlet has visualised this by sticking an iPad on the front of a HomePod just at random and forgetting that scale is the thing. My question with this is very similar to the question I ask about folding phones though, why? 
Why though? We already have iPads and they already have speakers so that's not a thing that we need to replace. Why would I want an iPad that's less mobile from room to room because it sounds a bit better? Surely a more useful idea would be to have the existing iPad know what room you're in via U1 and connect to the speakers in that room already when you make a FaceTime call. What am I missing here? And onto the less insane option and yes I'm looking forward to coming back to this video once I have a robot iPad companion sitting next to me which is that the next version of Apple TV could include HomePod style speakers and FaceTime cameras. Now that makes all the sense in the world and it ties in nicely with what I was talking about previously with a Kinect style Apple TV that sits above or below your TV just like the Wii sensor bar with LiDAR for motion tracking and it also fits with Apple's future mixed reality headset plans potentially for gaming. It could also integrate nicely with Apple Fitness Plus. FaceTime on your main screen in the house makes all the sense as well. That's what we've seen in sci-fi for years and for some reason we all just accepted that video calling was just something we did on computers and phones once it actually arrived. What I hadn't considered is the idea of the HomePod adding speakers so that you end up with like a high-end soundbar that also integrates with Apple TV, FaceTime, motion tracking. Surely that's the right move. TV speakers in the vast majority of cases suck pretty hard and so this would be pretty compelling when you buy a soundbar that you also get motion tracking with, security cameras, and it works with HomeKit and FaceTime. And Apple TV's smart home integration, this one seems like a win. Mini LED production issues may be behind hardware delays. Now these iPad Pros that we've been waiting for for so long are finally around the corner based on series leak this morning and fingers crossed we'll see that sweet sweet invite happen later today. But what's been the issue with the iPads Pro? It looks like the mini LED displays have been difficult to manufacture with low yields which is often the case for new technologies like this and as the production methods are improved this will ease. Of course if it doesn't then this doesn't bode well for the iMac and MacBook Pro models that we assumed would also be integrating these displays although they may well be produced by other manufacturers. I still expect that we'll see the iMacs at the April event and I desperately want to see the M1X powered MacBooks there too but I haven't given up hope. The latest renders that are on the screen right now from Apple tomorrow show what we're expecting from the 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M1X inside with more IO ports including the SD card reader that a lot of very loud people on the internet want to see. Remember that the vast majority of people don't even use SD card readers but a lot of people that make YouTube videos do so if you hear a lot of them telling everyone that everyone wants it it's just them. And quickly, I want to do a big shout out to Apple Tomorrow's Patreon as well because he does some awesome work. And if you like it, go and support some. On to the iCave answers. Jack Napoli asks, iCave answers, do you think Apple would ever consider allowing iPad Pros and iPad Pros only to dual boot Mac OS? I think this would be a killer selling point for the iPad and would easily pay 1,500 for this device. It would bring everyone waiting for a Surface Pro alternative and give them an immediate answer. This could be on the new models, and it would make chips simpler as they could release one a series and one M series yearly. I know it's unlikely, but I pray. So I'm afraid that is probably very, very unlikely. Uh, I don't see Apple wanting to bring Mac OS to the iPad because we've got iPad OS. iPad OS works perfectly for iPads. Mac OS works really, really well on Macs. So that's the way that they'll probably keep it. But you will see a lot more crossover between the apps. So Although you might not have the kind of Mac OS interface and you might not have the little buttons in the top where you can have all the multiple windows all over the screen that would be an absolute mess and nightmare to manage on an iPad anyway, you will basically get the same app. So does it really matter whether it tells you that it's running Mac OS or not? I think we'll see the underlying code get a lot closer together, but the interface will be the thing that stays slightly different. Joe Dancia asks, iCave answers why does Apple Music play random songs when my playlist finishes? It's similar to what I like but not quite. Like they've bought me a CD for a day present, but I gotta go and exchange it for something better, Woolies grinning face with smiling eyes. So just to be clear, Woolies is an old shop that used to exist in the UK, doesn't anymore, but it's where you used to go and buy your CDs and your tapes when you were a kid. So yeah, the way that Apple Music's recommendations work is that once you get to the end of a playlist, uh, if it's got nothing left in that playlist for you, it will find other stuff that people who listened to those songs then went on to listen to and it will kind of introduce you to some new artists that you may or might, may not like. It will push your tastes a little bit in different directions because that's the only way you discover stuff. If you just listen to stuff that you already listen to, you won't find new stuff that you like. Uh, but thank you very much for the question. Love you, wifey. Marcin Kovalchik asks, I cave answers do you think it is probable that Apple will socially distance and make no events at all prior to WWDC and possibly limited number of events in the fall? I think we probably are going to get an event next week since Sirius just told us about it. I know you asked me this question beforehand, but I wanted to feel all superior, so I was going to answer it anyway. Marcin Kovalchik asks, 
Why do people love haptic feedback so much especially with on-screen keyboards? I personally turn it off wherever I can and type fine without it. So that's why I've always wondered about this. My cave answers. So I think with haptic keyboards, the whole point is kind of you know when you've actually hit that key. Um, and it's also kind of to just replicate. I think people feel more comfortable with stuff when it feels like it would in person when you're doing something digitally but you actually feel it happen that gives you a kind of different experience of the device and it makes you feel more connected to it so it's very much like when we first started out with uh, ios all of the uh, all of the apps kind of had like a leather finish to make it feel like it was like a leather notebook uh, which was kind of a quality feel at the time and also they tried to make everything look like it did in the real world so like the compass looked like a physical compass the calculator looked like it had physical buttons all that sort of stuff it's called skeuomorphism and i guess it's like a haptic version of that where you kind of if you press on something you expect it to move so that's all it is i think and the haptic feedback that they put into i think it was the iphone 7 onwards in the home button that is a physical like it's a single piece of glass that's part of the front display not a separate piece it doesn't move same with the track pads that we have on macbooks um, when you press on it when you force press it doesn't click down but the whole thing just gives you a haptic feedback so you know that you've clicked so it's useful for that uh, if you don't need it that's cool too you are a digital purist krishna plays asks hey i back a good a good video would be why apple products expressive or or you could just answer it on iCave Answers a D. Can you please do this answer in the video? Thanks. Now I'm guessing that you're asking how, why Apple expen uh, Apple products are expensive, and to be completely honest, they're not particularly anymore. When you look at the entry level stuff that Apple's got now, you can get an iPad for three hundred dollars. Basically, you can get an iPhone for four hundred dollars. You can get uh, a Mac for six hundred ninety nine dollars cheaper if you're a student do you, you know what i mean so it's they're not particularly expensive they're certainly not expensive when you compare their performance to the stuff at a similar price from other people um in in the past they've always been slightly more expensive because a they were buying the stuff from other people which everyone was doing but they were more interested in making a quality device that lasted rather than making a cheap device that you uh, with razor thin margins so you would buy them more often they would prefer to make a good device that you would keep for a number of years especially when you come to Macs and things like that just look at the resale value on things like a 2012 MacBook Pro they still sell for a decent money they still sell for like two to three hundred dollars which is ridiculous for a nine-year-old computer we did a whole video on uh, the resale values of uh, Max, so you can check that out up here. But uh, that's the reason. They're just good. Jonathan Martin asks, iCave Answers, been subscribed for a few months now. Should I wait till your channel and even bigger to join the notification squad to get a bigger shout out? Or should I join now thinking face? You should definitely do it now, and you have joined the Notification Squad by posting up hashtag Notification Squad in the comments. So welcome aboard. If anyone else wants to join, all you do hit subscribe, ring the bell, and post up with hashtag notification squad down there and you will get a shout out too. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one.